I would move heaven, hell, and anything in between to get to you. You wouldn't be safe anyway if I was mad at you. And that's not bull, Dip, that's truth. I've went up against people. You could pull a gun on me, and if I'm mad at you, I'm coming forward. You'd have to shoot me to stop me. And if you don't kill me, you're stupid. So next time you see me, <laughs> I will kill you. Mr. Kuklinski, we're going to conduct a plant search here. Put your arms out. In 1991, Richard Kuklinski a contract killer known as the Iceman, was interviewed by HBO for an America Undercover special. How many people have you killed? I had an approximate guess. Approximate will go away. More than 100. After a lifetime of killing for hire, Kuklinski was finally caught by an undercover ATF agent wearing a hidden wire. Are you willing to uh, go out on a, on, a, on a contract? If the price is right, I don't talk to anybody. Yeah, but how the fuck do you put it together? Like, you know what I'm saying? Oh, there's always a way, there's a will, there's a way, my friend. Richard Kuklinski is one of the most dangerous criminals we have ever come across in this state. He murdered by guns, he murdered by strangulation, he murdered by putting poison on victims' food. He did all of this at the same time while exhibiting a normal, placid family existence. His wife, his children uh, were uninvolved in his criminal activities. Yet, uh, we are faced with uh, evidence, convicting evidence of uh, numerous grisly murders. In 1986, the ATF and the New Jersey Organized Crime Task Force set up a roadblock outside Kuklinski's home. It took five men to bring down the six foot five, 300 pound killer and force handcuffs on him. The Iceman's career as a master criminal was finally over. Richard Kuklinski knows he will never get out of jail. With nothing left to lose, Kuklinski reveals new secrets about the years he spent as a contract killer for the Gambino crime family, and tells what happened in his life that turned him into a man law enforcement called the Iceman. I hated my father. If I could have, I probably would have killed him. Probably would have felt good about it, too. My father would beat me just for the, just if I looked at him. He gave me this impersonal feeling I have to when people die in front of me, especially loudmouth people. Loudmouth people remind me of my father. Once a loudmouth person starts with me, I love it. That's the only excuse I need. One night in a bar, a loudmouth made the mistake of insulting the 18-year-old Kuklinski in front of people. A couple of hours later, the Iceman saw his chance to get even. I come out of this bar and I see him sleeping in his car. I said, I got you, little sucker. Now I got you. I'm gonna give you. A, I'm gonna light your fire, <laughs> and I did. I got myself a bottle, some gasoline, and I threw it in the car with him. And he was screaming and yelling and burning, and the car burned. And I could smell him. I walked down the block and I could hear him as I turned the corner. He was still yelling.
This was a personal thing, yes. Yeah. This was a guy I disliked. What did he do to you? He made me mad. By the age of 25, Richard Kuklinski had no problem with murder. But now he wanted to get paid for it. There was money in contract killing. To prove himself, he auditioned for Mafia Capo Roy DeMeo. He said, well, I would expect you to, uh, if you came with me, I'd expect you to, uh, if I told you to whack somebody, you'd whack him without any question. So I said, well, I could probably do that. He says, uh, you probably could do it or could you do it? Did you, do you think you could do it? And I said, yeah, I think I could do it. So he told Freddie to get the car, got the car. He and I got in the back seat, Freddie was driving. We drove someplace, I'm, I don't know where it was, it was someplace in New York. And we were sitting there for a while, we got to where we were going, we were sitting there for a while, and a man came in the distance, he was walking his dog, it looked like. So he said, all right. Take this guy down. I said, which, what? Which guy are we talking about here? So he says, the man walking the dog. So I got out of the car and I started walking towards the man. And the man was walking his dog just like a regular guy. As he passed me, I turned around and shot him. Freddie and Roy pulled up in the car, I got in the car, and we drove away. And that is how I got involved with Roy, with doing things like that. Roy DeMeo's hangout was the Gemini Lounge in Brooklyn, New York. It was a house of horrors, where over a hundred people were murdered, chopped up, and disposed of by DeMeo and his gang of lethal contract killers. After proving himself, Kuklinski quickly became one of DeMeo's favorite enforcers. DeMeo ordered the hits, and Kuklinski executed them without question. He wanted this guy uh, taken care of. Uh, but he wanted to talk to him first. So uh, when I got to the place, I asked the man for the money, so the guy says he didn't have it and Roy would just have to wait until he got the money to pay him. And that was that, he'd have to wait. I, so I said to the man, I said, well, you, you have to then talk to him. He wants to talk to you. So. I dialed the phone number, and uh, he got on the phone, and I said, he wants to talk to you. So he was talking to him, and uh, I guess they were acting like everything was all right, because he got off the phone, he handed me the phone back. He says, hey, I told you he'd wait. He's in the frame of mind. Don't worry about it. He wants to talk to you now. So I picked up the phone, and he said, kill him. So I shot him. Hung up the phone and walked away. I am just a hardworking expediter of sorts. I looked at myself as a person who did something that somebody wanted done, and they paid me a good price. In the early 80s, the Gambinos were feeling the heat of an intense investigation, which reached as high as their boss, Paul Castellano. 
As the pressure from law enforcement grew, the family began to worry about potential witnesses. One in particular presented a major problem. His name was Peter Calabro. The family ordered a hit, and Kuklinski was given the contract. On March 14, 1980, Kuklinski drove for hours on a snow-covered road in Saddle River, New Jersey, waiting for a call to come through on his walkie-talkie. I get a call that they're on their way. So now they're coming. And it's snowing. The roads are very bad. A lot of snow slipping and sliding. And I was in a van. So what I figured is, at the last moment, I had a, a different plan with it. At the last moment, I decided, well, I'm going to double park this thing. This will give me the edge because this will make him have only one way to come by, and that's he has to come right by this van. And I go to the back of the van, and I go out the back door. I take the shotgun with me, of course. So I kneel down, and I look under the van so I can see where he's approximately at. So I watch him come up to where he's almost in the front of the van, and I stood up. And as he's going by the van, I fired. I never knew the man, you know, what he looked like or what his job was. Then I found out the next day that he was uh, police. But had I been told to do him anyway, and I knew he was the police, I most likely would have done it anyway. I don't think I would have said no. Kuklinski had killed a cop, a cop who had gone bad, selling information to the Gambinos, a cop who was eliminated before he could turn state's witness. For Kuklinski, contracts like the Calabro murder were strictly business. They gave him the money he needed for his family. The Iceman was leading a double life. He lived on a quiet street in Bergen County, New Jersey, surrounded by neighbors who had no idea they were living next door to a mafia hitman. He was determined that no one, not even his own family, would ever find out who he really was. I never questioned him, and you just knew, don't do it, don't ask. Uh, if he got up at 2 o'clock in the morning or during dinner and put on his shoes and walked out the door, you said, bye. You didn't say, where are you going or why are you going? And it was just understood that that's the way it was. I was the happiest when I was with Barbara. Never involved in anything I ever did, never told her anything I did. If I did, I probably would have shocked the pants off her. I don't, she knew I had a violent temper, and I did have a violent temper. But I don't think she thought I would go as far as I did go. Richard's time with his family was sacred, and any interference would throw him into a rage. It made him even more angry if it happened during the holidays. This fella, he owed uh, me about $1,600. So here we come Christmas Eve. And I go there and he says, now nah, come with me, we'll go out, we'll have a good time, we'll party, we'll meet some broads with this, that, the other thing. I said, no, I gotta, I would really like the money. I gotta buy something, and uh, you know, they gave me a, a story, a bull story. So I left there. I was uh, a little bit upset. Got on the bus, went home. I 
I was uh, putting the toys together for the kids, and this thing was really bugging me. It was annoying me. It was just making my whole disposition bad. Thought just occurred to me, this is bullshit. It was Christmas Eve, after midnight, his family was sleeping. Kuklinski got in his car and drove to New York City. I went to the bar. They told me he just left and he was parked a couple blocks down in the parking lot. I believe the parking lot was closed, but he, he was parked in there. I saw his car, his car was running, but it had snow on it. So I knocked on the door and he said, hey, how are you? Glad to see you. Come on, sit down. So I go walk around the pasture side, sit down, I'm talking to him. I said, look, I really need the money. I says, you know, it's not right. You've been, you've just been playing me like a fool here. I had this pistol in my hand and he just was annoying me to no end with this babbling. And he was just going on and on. And I fired. And I couldn't see a damn thing because there was snow on the windows. And when that flash went off, I just had spots before my eyes. My ears were ringing because the noise inside the car when the, the gun went off. I couldn't hear, couldn't see. Then I panicked because now I don't know what's going on. Anyway, I had caught the guy in the temple, and as he moved back, the second shot caught him in under the chin. Only about the time I could see, I reached in the man's pocket, and he had a roll of money. I took my $1,600 off him, put the rest of the money on him. That was his in his pocket. Got out of the car and walked away. And that's when it happened one Christmas Eve in New York City. The Iceman had killed by gun, by knife, by Molotov cocktail, and cyanide. But he also liked to experiment. Crossbow was, I just popped the guy in the forehead with it. Actually, it was just <laughs> seeing if it would work. What was he doing at the time? Looking at me. Well. Was he sitting down, or were you standing over him? Or? No, he actually bent down to look in the car window like I was asking him directions. I didn't know the man. Was this a contract murder, or was it something out of anger, or was it a personal thing? Neither. What, what was it? I just wanted to see if this thing would work. You mean you're experimenting on somebody? Right. Did it work? It sure did. It went halfway into his head. Kuklinski was always looking for new ways to get away with murder. In the 80s, a man who was nicknamed Mr. Softy teamed up with Kuklinski. This harmless looking ice cream vendor was in reality an army trained demolitions expert who was a violent and vicious killer. Mr. Softy was an individual by the name of Robert Prange. He used to operate a Mr. Softy truck. That's why he got the name Mr. Softy. He became friendly with Kuklinski, very friendly with him. And 
it is our opinion that that uh, friendship led to uh, Richard Kukwinski learning a lot about uh, killing with different types of chemicals, including cyanide. He taught me a lot, basically. But he was extremely crazy. But he would read all kinds of books on destruction and all kinds of ways to, uh, to destroy somebody. He used to go around this Mr. Softy truck. That's how he used to spot people and get the outlay of the land, you know, where they were and easy ways. And sometimes he'd do it right from the truck. And he sold ice cream? Yes, he did. Sold Mr. Softy. He had one of those Mr. Softy right. trucks. Did and you ever see them? That's what he sold. And he sold ice cream to the little kids in the neighborhood? Yes, he did. And that's what he did. He sold. He'd go into these neighborhoods and sell ice cream to the kids and maybe kill one of their fathers. On August 9, 1984, Mr. Softy was found dead hanging out of the driver's side seat in his Mr. Softy ice cream truck. He had been killed by multiple gunshot wounds to the head. I think Kukwinski killed him because he used him for his information, he used him for his knowledge. He probably brought him around, brought him with him on certain jobs that he did. And it was, it was time for the boss to make the decision uh, that he didn't want any more loose ends. He may have said something the wrong way to Richie, who knows, whatever it was, Kukwinski, in my opinion, made the decision to kill him. After Prongay's murder, Kukwinski was hired for a dangerous contract no one else would touch. It was here in a crowded discotheque that the cyanide killing techniques learned from Mr. Softy paid off. Couldn't get to this person. He was in a uh, disco. So I was really in a bad way because there was a time schedule involved. And I happened to be watching these people and there was a couple of gay people dancing and whatever. And nobody was paying them no mind whatsoever. They were walking anywhere. Going anywhere because people basically don't look at gay people. But the idea came to me, yeah, try to act gay, but how in the hell am I going to get by? A 300-pound gay man, I mean, you know, that's a little bit far-fetched. So I went to the extreme of far-fetched. I got this loudest costume you'd ever want to see on. I mean, I went full-blown gay person. Of course, maybe not a gay people are going to be pissed off at me, but I'm not saying anything bad about them. But I got this canary yellow sweater and these bright pants, and uh, I got these elevated shoes, which I'm told to be good. Now I got these thing shoes on, and I acted like a full-blown gay person. I mean, and... I got on this thing and I'm doing this like dancing bit and I get onto this thing and they got these lights and I hate those lights by the way, those strobe lights. Man, I hate those lights. They can't see good with them lights and it messes up my eyes. So anyway, I'm trying to get close to this guy. So I'm doing this crazy thing. I'm acting real swishy. I guess that's what you would call it. And I get up close to this guy and I bump into him but everybody's bumping in everybody 
and he had a heart attack. Because I had hypothermia, you know. When I bumped into him, I, I popped him with the needle. What was in the needle? In his case, a heart attack. There was no doubt that Richard Kuklinski was a stone-cold killer, and most people thought that's why he was called the Iceman. But law enforcement had another reason for pinning this name on him. They called him the Iceman because to confuse the time of death, he would take his victims and put them in a freezer for long periods of time. One such victim was a man named Louis Masgay. He did too good a job on this body. After leaving the body in a freezer for over two years, he then took the body out and dumped it where it was found before it had thawed out. So when the medical examiner does the autopsy and opens the body up, he finds ice inside the body on a warm summer's day. The medical examiner says, there's something wrong here. This guy couldn't have died in the past few days. After the discovery of the half-frozen body of Louis Masgay, the noose began to tighten around Kuklinski and his boss, Roy DeMeo. Under pressure from law enforcement, DeMeo began to act erratically, and the family felt he was about to crack and testify against them. There was no question in their minds, he had to go. In 1983, De Mayo's body was found in a trunk of a car. He had been shot five times and had been dead a week. There were some who thought Kuklinski might be responsible. Do you know anything about his murder? Who, De Mayo? Yeah. He outlived his usefulness. And he was uh, running the wrong way. Apparently, everybody thought he was going to run to the law. What did you feel when uh, he was killed? How'd you feel about it? I was all broken up over it. I got a bridge for you, too, I want to sell you. What? I got a bridge for you, too. I want to sell you a bridge. I wasn't broken up over him. That was a, my attempt at levity. But I thought at the time it couldn't happen to a nicer person. If somebody had to die that day, it was a good day for him to die. Over the next three years, the New Jersey Organized Crime Task Force concentrated on closing in on Kuklinski. When Kuklinski began to feel cornered, he started eliminating anyone who could implicate him in his criminal activities. If he called you friend, you had a problem. Yesterday's friend soon became tomorrow's enemy. One of those friends turned enemy was a man who had been Kuklinski's partner. His name was George Maliband. Georgie boy. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, I liked him. Actually, yeah, really liked him. One of the few people I ever really liked. But Maliband had developed some bad habits. He racked up thousands of dollars in gambling debts to loan sharks. Kuklinski had vouched for him and told Maliband he'd better pay up. Then Maliband made a fatal mistake. He told Kuklinski that if he didn't back off, he would hurt his family. Which really struck a nerve with me. It, it, 
it upset me, but I was trying not to uh, get upset with it at that time. So I figured he was just nervous maybe and he was just spouting off, but uh, apparently he wasn't. But the Iceman couldn't forget that Maliband had threatened his family, and several weeks later, he began to plan his murder. We got in the van, and uh, I said, George, we, you're really sincere with the fact that, that you had hurt my family and uh, to get back at me. And he said, uh, that's the only way I could get you, I could get over on you, or get you to do what I wanted you to do, is to hurt your family. I said, but that's a stupid thing to say, George. I said, knowing how badly or how sincere I am about my family, I said, for you to say something like that, you must realize you're going to make me mad. He said, no, you won't be mad. He said, because you'd be afraid that something would happen to your family. I said, well, you're very wrong about that, George. I said, because I'm going to put a stop to that. As a matter of fact, I'm going to put a stop to that right now. And I shot him five times. I could see them entering, because he was right here. He was sitting in the van, I'm in the driver's seat, Georgie boy was over here. In the next seat, which was, you know, just like that. And I went pop, pop, pop. And I went pop, pop. And I could see the material moving on in the, on his jacket has these things. Actually, they made little marks on it. They, on the jacket, I guess they were burn marks. So. Kuklinski's favorite way of disposing of bodies was putting them in barrels. But with a six foot, 300 pound George Malaband, it wasn't easy. So when I got him in, I had a problem with one leg. A hell of a problem with a leg, I'll tell you. No matter what I did, I couldn't get that leg in there. So I had to cut it. And put the top on. And I drove down to Jersey City, where I dumped him. The next morning, a passerby noticed a dented steel drum turned over on its side. When he walked over to get a closer look, he saw a pair of legs, one of them bloody and hacked. The body was George Maliband. Police knew Kuklinski was the last person to see him alive. The New Jersey Organized Crime Task Force now had just one mission, to gather the evidence to arrest and convict Richard Kuklinski. The final method that was used was in fact the introduction of a uh, undercover federal agent, Dominic Polifron, uh, who was able to win Mr. Kuklinski's confidence and was able to record conversations where he detailed his participation in these murders. I portrayed myself as a hitman. I told him I worked for the uh, wise guys downtown New York, and my, my brother was a good fella downtown, and uh, I went by the name of Dominic Michael Provenzano. You know, I just have a few problems I want to dispose of. I have some rats I want to get rid of. Yeah. The only fucking thing I don't understand, don't you use a fucking piece of iron to get rid of these fucking people? Use this fucking uh, sign Why be messy? You can do it nice and calm. The tapes made by the undercover agent had nailed Richard Kuklinski, and his career as a contract killer was finally over. At his trial, his family learned for the first time that they really didn't know the Richard Kuklinski, who was also capable of being the deadly Iceman. Richard Kuklinski is now serving multiple life sentences in New Jersey State Maximum Security Prison. Ironically, his younger brother Joey is also serving a life sentence in the same prison.
When Joey was 25, he was convicted of raping and murdering a 12-year-old girl. After he strangled the girl, he dragged her body over two adjoining rooftops and threw her and her pet dog to the street 40 feet below. Want to talk about your brother, or you want to talk about? There's nothing to talk about. Because we never brought up your brother in the first show. But and, we'll uh, talk about him. We'll talk about him. He's yeah. been here for 25, seven years, something like that. He's been here a long time, 25 years, I think. They don't hold me to that exactly, but I'm pretty sure it's pretty close. And he's here for murder. Yes. What happened? How old was he when? Uh... He was a young man. He was in his twenties, I believe. And what wrong, went wrong in his case? Do you think he still was a product, also, of you know what you went through? We come from the same father. Do you see him, Richard? I pass him. What do you say? Just hello and keep on walking. I don't, Joe. How are you? Take care. That's it? I told you I have dual short stories. That's, that's being over-friendly with my brother. Does he try to talk to you? He says less to me, as a matter of fact. Sometimes he doesn't even answer me, I don't think, thinking about it. That's too bad. Depends how you look at it. If by some uh, miracle, Richard, you got out of here tomorrow, let's say, hmm. but let's, for the sake of argument, what would you do? Would you go back to that life or would you do something no. else? No. It's past me now. I have 10 years without violence. I don't really look forward to violence anymore. I don't even think I could play the game anymore. Probably get myself shot the first time out. I wouldn't do it anyway. I'd look to retire in a nice, quiet place someplace. No banging doors, no people yelling and screaming. Somewhere if I wanted to think, I could just sit there and think. Is there anything you wouldn't do, Richard, for uh, a contract murder? Yes. What wouldn't you do? I wouldn't kill the child. And most likely wouldn't kill a woman. Did you ever let anyone go for whatever reason, did you ever decide to let someone go? Yes. But then I thought better of the idea and shot him anyway. Did you ever murder anyone you liked? All my friends did. At one point in time, I'm sure I liked them. But not at the moment of killing them. I might have even liked him then. Honor among thieves? There's no such thing. You see, because I was put in prison by a man I knew 30 years, and I liked him. Big mistake. I had one friend too many. I'm now serving multi-life sentences because of my one friend. And he's the only friend I didn't kill.
Hoffa? Yeah. I don't know anything about Hoffa, Jimmy Hoffa. Oh, the scuttlebutt, let's say, let's put it that way. Scuttlebutt, he's in a Japanese car. Supposedly he was picked up, put in a drum, put in the trunk of a car, put in a crusher with other cars, crushed, and shipped overseas. That's what I heard. Don't know. I think the last time I asked you that, you thought he was a uh, Toyota. Could be a Toyota. Some little Japanese car. <laughs>